Good evening, everyone. So wonderful to see all the smiling faces. You know, when you're smiling, the whole world smiles back at you. And it's a whole lot easier to make friends, too. In the School of Evangelism, we're learning a lot about making new friends. And that would be making friends with everyone in the world that we meet. Um, God is transforming us through the renewing of our minds to, to see what God has created in everyone. And he wants to save us all. And he fights our battles for us. And we're going to sing about that. Let's sing. In heavenly armor we'll enter the land. The battle belongs to the Lord. No weapons are fashioned against us will stand. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. When the power of darkness comes in like a flood, the battle belongs to the Lord. He raised up a standard, the power of his blood. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. When your enemy presses in heart, do not fear. The battle belongs to the Lord. Take courage, my friend, your redemption is dear. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. We'll have one more song before we start our devotional. How great thou art. <clears throat> Sing. O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds I hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe display. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. When through the woods and forest glades I wander, I hear the birds sing sweetly trees when I look down from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze then sings my soul my 
Today I'll be talking about Noah and the Ark today. I chose this story because it's a good story and has a good meaning and a lot of point to it. So here's like a little backstory of it. We're not sure if it rained before the great flood, but it would make sense if they didn't know. Since in Genesis chapter 2 verses 5 through 6 it says, Before any plant of the field was in the earth and before any herb of the field had grown, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on earth, And there was no man to till the ground, but a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. But here it starts the story. Noah was a good guy and lived a good life, but God saw everybody else not following him the way it should be. So God decided he was going to flood the earth, but he didn't want the whole world to be gone. So he chose Noah to build an ark. Here in Genesis chapter 6, verses 15, he said, The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits. It's width 50 cubits, and it's height 30 cubits, and you shall make a window for the ark. And then in Genesis chapter 6, verse 17, he says, And also he said, You I shall establish my covenant, covenant with you, who shall bring you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives. And right here he says, And he said, And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of the birds after their kind, of animals after their kind, and of every creeping thing of the earth after its kind. Two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive and take all food for you. Right here, this part is really important because not everybody knows this in detail. detail. Genesis chapter 7, verse 2, he said, You shall take with you seven each of every clean animal, a male and his female, to each of animals that are unclean, a male and his female, also seven each of birds of the air, a male and female, to keep these species alive on the face of all the earth. Everybody thinks it's just two of every animal, so that right there is really important. After that, he said, the earth will rain for 40 days and 40 nights, and everything God said, Noah did according to him. 
Then after that, Noah sent out a raven, and he also sent out himself a dove, to see if the water had receded from the earth, and the dove had no landing spot, because all the water was still on the face of the earth. So then Noah waited another seven days. Then he sent out the dove, and she came back with an olive leaf in her mouth, so that uh, told Noah that the waters receded from the earth. And it came to pass, in the six hundred first year, in the first month, on the first day of the month, the surface of the land was dry. Then on the day, on the twenty-seventh day of the month, the earth was now dry. The dove represents to tell Noah a time of peace and deliverance is now here. After it rained, and after God called a wind to subside the waters on the earth, God made a promise to never flood the earth again. He made that promise with a rainbow in the sky. Then God called out to bring out every living thing out of the ark, so now that they can abound and multiply throughout the earth. The point I got across the story was trust in God's process and give obedience to God. Noah built the ark, not even worrying about his and his family's future, because he trusted God with everything he had. God gave him commands, and he followed them without being hesitant. This story also represents faith and patience, and that it is possible to walk with God, even though everything around you seems to be falling apart. And then finally, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, it says, By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Pray with me, please. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for all that you've done for us, for all that you do. We pray that in everything we do, that we bring you honor and glory, how we act, how we speak, how we treat others. Help us always to try to search out and understand your word, and help us to always have an open heart. In everything that we are and everything we do, thank you, God. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You dismiss classes. Okay. Good evening. Good to see everybody back here tonight as we continue our study of Thessalonians. Uh, last time we talked about, uh, in chapter 2, really focusing in on the conduct of Paul and the messengers that were with him, uh, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, and the way that they uh, acted while they were there amongst the Thessalonians and the nature of their presentation of the gospel how they weren't trying to be like all of the other teachers that were around, trying to uh, deceive these people, trying to uh, get them to follow something that they knew was untrue. He mentioned and, and showed that they were fully convicted and convinced of the message that they were sharing, and that that was evidenced by the fact that the Thessalonians responded in 
the way that they did. And Paul talked about the affection and longing uh, that he had for the brethren, that he treated them, uh, he likened it to a nursing mother and the affection that a mother has for her child, and also um, as a father who guides his children. All right? And so clearly Paul has this very uh, special relationship and feeling uh, that he has towards the Thessalonian brethren. And so tonight, we're going to continue on into chapter 2 and hopefully into chapter 3. So as last night we talked about, or excuse me, last Wednesday we talked about faithful messengers in Paul, Silas, and Timothy. Uh, we're going to begin this section of chapter 2 by looking at the Thessalonians as faithful hearers. It says, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God, which are in Judea in Christ Jesus. For you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judeans, who killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they do not please God, and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they may be saved, so as always to fill up the measure of their sins. But wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. All right, so starting here, he says, uh, you received the word which you heard from us, and then you welcomed it. The idea that Paul is trying to present here about the Thessalonians is that they had an open mind about the things that Paul taught. That's the idea of you, you received it, right? They didn't just reject Paul's message outright. They actually listened and considered uh, what it was. And for the Greeks, <clears throat> the idea of choosing the religion of your choice would have been very apparent, right? There were, there were multiple gods and goddesses that one could choose to, to give their devotion to. And so for people who grew up steeped in these various traditions of idolatry and paganism, it would have been very easy to dismiss the teachings of Paul just like the other number of religious teachings, right? That Paul's is just one similar teaching amongst all of these other different teachings. They were oversaturated with religion. But even more than that, you have to consider what Paul's message would have sounded like to the Greeks and to the Jews. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 20 through 25, it talks about the foolishness of preaching or the foolishness of the message preached. And I think about that idea of the foolishness of the gospel. To claim that God came in the flesh, that God was crucified as a criminal, and now he was worthy of worship, when you just kind of lay it out on paper like that, it sounds kind of insane. And yet, that's what is the truth. And so the Thessalonians, rather than just rejecting that outright, which had been contrary to everything they thought about God, they received Paul's words. They listened. They considered the message that he preached, right? And so I think we have to approach life the same way, to approach things with an open mind, to be willing to consider that there might be a better way than our way, even when it applies to our religious beliefs. Right? The Thessalonians were open-minded. They received the word of God. And because they were open-minded, they ended up being converted. They, they found something much better than where they were. Right? So let's, when we're having religious discussions, let's at least maintain an open mind. Never, never um, getting away from the truth, but let's receive the words. And then we can decide whether or not they're true or false. Right? But let's receive the message. Yes, sir. Right, okay, and that is true. They believe Paul more sincerely, right? If, if we go back to chapter 1 and verse 5, why might the Thessalonians have given more credence to Paul's message? What does it say there in chapter 1, verse 5? Uh, 
Right? Our gospel did not come to you in word only, but how? In power and in what? And in the Holy Spirit. Right? And so when Paul was preaching this message to them, they had, they had proof that it was divine. So not only did they receive it, right? when they had this proof that it was true, they, they welcomed it. And that's the idea, this idea of welcoming isn't just the idea of hearing it, it's the idea of acceptance. Right? They recognized that there was something different about Paul's preaching and that it wasn't the works of men, it wasn't just the words of other teachers like they had heard their entire life. Paul was bringing something that was divine, right? It was, in truth, the Word of God, and they could see that because Paul's teaching was accompanied by the power and miraculous workings of the Holy Spirit. And so when they saw that, they were willing to say, okay, this is the real deal. This is worthy of following. And so he brings that up here. This Word had power. They accepted it as truth, and it says, which also effectively works in you who believe. Right? And notice this idea effectively works. This is in the present tense. Right? He doesn't say that the word of God effectively worked in you who believe as if everything about their conversion was already done with. Right? What that tells me is that though their conversion happened in the past, right? they, they received the word, they welcomed the word, right? all past tense, it was still having an effect on their lives because it effectively works or it is effectively working in you who believe. Right? I'm reminded of Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2, where Paul says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. But right? the idea of being conformed right, is the idea of being pressed into a mold. Right? Think of like uh, when you were a kid and you were playing with a Play-Doh set. Right? You would get those little molds, cram all the Play-Doh into it, you push it down, and then suddenly you've got like a Play-Doh pizza or, or whatever it is you're playing with. Right? That's being conformed. Transform means that you are becoming something entirely new. Right? The way that a caterpillar turns into a butterfly. Right? You don't look at a caterpillar and you think, oh yeah, that's going to turn into a beautiful insect with these intricate designs on their wings and it can fly right the only reason we think that is because we know that it happens it becomes something completely different well that change can only take place if our minds are being renewed by the word of god but that work is something that doesn't just happen we're baptized we believe and suddenly we're done right we've done all of our work and this is a continual Process So the word was still effective and still working in their lives. And then Paul goes on, verse 14, says, You, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God which are in Judea and Christ Jesus, for you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen just as they did from the Judeans. Right? Now, in this instance, why would Paul try to connect the persecution and suffering of the Thessalonians with the persecution of their brethren in Judea. Why would he try to connect those together? Yeah, there you go, to give an example of perseverance. So that they knew, okay, we have brothers and sisters in Jerusalem, who suffered persecution for the cause of Christ, and, and they had it rough too. And so if they were able to withstand that persecution, well, then we can withstand that persecution too, right? They've got this example of what to do, and they've also got this reminder that they are not alone or unique in their suffering, right? One of the best things that, that you can do if you're going through a hard time is to find other people who have experienced something similar and talk to them about it, right? Share that struggle with other people. Um, in a lot of my classes that I've been, been taking this semester for my uh, counseling, one of the classes is group counseling, and it notes that people 
who struggle, say, for instance, with addiction, those who actually go to group therapy and find a community of other people are far, far, far less likely to relapse into those behaviors because they have a group of people and they know they're not alone in their struggles, right? In 1 Peter chapter 5, beginning in verse 8 and into verse 9, it says, Be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. When Paul is trying to encourage people, or excuse me, when Peter was encouraging those brethren to stay faithful, he said, hey, the devil is after you, but guess what? All of your brethren have experienced the same sufferings too. All of your, your other uh, Christian family in the world, they know what you're going through. They are experiencing these same things. And so I think Paul here is trying to encourage the brethren by connecting them to these other faithful Christians to say, hey, you may be separated by hundreds of miles, but you're brothers in Christ and are going through the same challenges. Right? You're not alone in your struggle. And so then in verse 15, right, he gives this encouragement for them to keep going, and then he turns his focus onto the persecutors. And I think he does this to, um, number one, let the Christians know exactly what they were up against, but also to let them know that in the end, God is the one who's going to win. Right? He says, they killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets. Right? He's talking about the Jews who had a history of uh, anybody that didn't agree with what was already going on, we were going to reject them. You look through the history of the prophets, whenever they brought a message that was disliked by the leadership, they were persecuted. When Jesus brought a message that was disliked by the people who had power and influence in religion, well, they persecuted him and had him killed on the cross. And so Paul brings out that what was happening to them now, where you had these Jews who were following Paul and Silas and Timothy, uh, who, who didn't like Christianity, that were trying to, to harm and persecute people, he says, hey, this is the pattern that the Jews have followed pretty much throughout their history. Right? This is something that you could almost count on. But he talks about all of these negative things about their persecutors. They don't please God. They're contrary to all men. They're trying to keep us from the Gentiles. But what's important is what I have highlighted there in Magenta. They fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. How would that idea be a comfort to the Thessalonians? That they were storing up the wrath, that their persecutors, rather, were storing up the wrath of God. Okay, some, some validation. Right. Be, val, they're, they're validated in their suffering because... They're being told that, hey, God sees what's happening. Your suffering isn't being overlooked, and those who are harming you, they're not going to get away with what they're doing. Unless they repent and they have that measure of their sins forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ, there's going to be punishment. They are not going to get away with it. Sometimes I think we can look at the world and have this idea that, you know what, Satan's winning. But the Thessalonians made the right choice. They were pleasing God. They were suffering because they pleased God. But that didn't mean that God didn't see. And God was still going to win. All of, all of that wickedness was going to be dealt with in the judgment day. And so they could take comfort and be validated in their faith and in their suffering, knowing that God was aware and knowing that God was going to take care of it. Right? And so a faithful hearer, just like the Thessalonians, they, they receive the word of God. When they recognize its truthfulness, they welcome it and accept it and integrate it into their lives, even when there are consequences. Even when there may be persecution, a faithful hearer follows through and obeys. 
And then Paul, in the next section, after once again giving them the Thessalonians' commendation, he wants to talk about his desire to be there with them. But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire. Therefore, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope? our joy, or crown of rejoicing. Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For you are our glory and joy. So he opens this section after giving them this commendation. He says, but we, brethren, want to see you with great desire. I think Paul is trying to make a contrast from the previous verses where you had these persecutors who were trying to keep Paul away from Thessalonica They were trying to keep Paul from speaking, but that did not do anything to stop Paul's desire to be with them. Paul wasn't going to stop preaching and spreading the gospel message simply because uh, there were people that wanted him to stop and were trying to kill him. That was nothing to Paul because he knew that the job was that important. And so he says, we've been taken away from you from a short time in presence, but not in heart. Now, when Paul left Thessalonica, did he do it of his own free will? No, right? Paul wanted to stay longer, but under threat of death from the Jews, he decided he needed to leave, and he went on and he preached in Athens and in Corinth. He continued sharing God's word, But Thessalonica was too much of a hot spot for him to stay there. He got run out of town, right? Uh, When he says, uh, we, brethren, have been taken away from you, it seems that Paul and Silas and Timothy, all of them at some point or another, were driven away uh, from Thessalonica. Now, this letter was very likely written from Corinth. We mentioned that in our introduction And if that is the case, it could have been over a year since he left Thessalonica and had contact with them. Um, At the very least, it was more than a year before he had an opportunity to return. And so how can Paul say that we've been taken away from you for a short time? How can Paul call that a short time? Because Paul has an eternal clock. Right? I, I think that's a very beautiful way of expressing that. Right? A year may seem like a long time to us, especially if it's like, okay, here's this person that's come, and they've completely changed my, my worldview. They've opened my eyes to the truth. I've changed my life, and then I haven't seen them for a year. It could be a little, a little daunting, a little jarring. But Paul was viewing his circumstances from eternity. Right? Nothing was going to last forever, not even this persecution. Not even these difficulties. But I think it also says, hey, we've, we've been taken away from you from a short time in presence. We can't be there with you. But we haven't been taken away in heart. Right? Paul was still thinking about them. Paul would say to the Colossians, it says, though I am absent in the flesh, I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Even though Paul couldn't physically be with them, he reminded them through this letter of how much he cared, of how much he was thinking about them. He talked about knowing their suffering and referenced their suffering several times throughout this letter already. And so this letter serves a very important purpose in reminding the Thessalonians that they were not forgotten. Right? How, how might the relationship between Paul and the Thessalonians be affected if he had not taken the time to write this letter? Remember, put yourself in the shoes of the Thessalonians. Like I said, their entire worldview had been changed as a result of Paul and the others and their message, and then to receive zero communication from them afterwards. How would, that, how would that affect your faith if you were in Thessalonica? Right. 
right? And so Ronnie brings up the lack of, of further encouragement and instruction. Without that extra instruction, people are just going to kind of feel lost and confused, and why am I going to deal with all this persecution and, 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 and confusion, right? Like he said, probably be losing people by the week. And then Dana brought up that so much of Christianity is about relationships. You know, God didn't create a system where it's just between me and him. Right? He created a system where I have a Christian family and a group of people that I'm also accountable to, to, to care for, to watch out for, and who also should be watching out for me. Right? Okay. Yes. Uh, I, I don't know. It's possible that they did have an expectation that Paul would come back. I mean, he certainly expressed his desire to be there, right? And we don't know exactly what their um, interactions may have been when he left. But certainly, if he had not continued to put forth the effort, I could imagine a feeling of abandonment. If, you know, even despite these circumstances... If Paul had just kind of left them high and dry, that could build up some feelings of resentment. Paul wasn't going to do that, right? He made it very clear that he wanted to be there for them, right? That's why he says, we endeavor more eagerly to see you with great desire. Notice how emphatic Paul is being, right? That we really, really, really want to be there and to see your face with great desire, right? Why was it so important for Paul to be there face to face? I mean, he, he was able to communicate with them in a limited way through letters. Why, why did he want to be there physically with them? Yeah, Jim talks about how important fellowship is that, and, and that togetherness is required. And really, a face-to-face -face interaction with the Thessalonians was going to provide them so much more comfort and encouragement than a letter ever would. Right? Communications experts talk about how the bulk of what we say is actually found in our body language and our tone of voice rather than the words that we're actually speaking, right? Paul wanted to be there face-to-face -face so he could teach them better, so that he could better attend to their individual needs. And if Paul desired personal interactions like that, that should tell us how important they are for us, right? Especially in, in 2024, right? We are very, very connected, right? Communication has never been easier, However, even in an age where we are so connected, long-distance relationships are still a challenge because they lack that essential feeling of togetherness, right? When, when I was in college for one semester before Dana and I got married, we FaceTimed every night, and yet I still really looked forward to the weekends where I got to go back home because we got to be together, right? We need that as brethren. We need to be together as brethren. You know, it's one thing just to, to maybe say hi to one another in passing when we're here at worship, and it's another thing to really be involved in one another's lives, right? For Paul, it was important that he was there with them. We should put that same priority on being there with and there for our brethren. Right? He, he made it very, very clear that was what he wanted. I want to be with you because that's how he was going to have the greatest impact on them as Christians was when they could have that close face-to-face -face interaction. Right? And so he, he mentions all of this, and then he says that Satan hindered us. Um, Paul had talked before about his travel plans being, being hindered or interrupted in Romans 1.13. He tells the brethren there that, I don't want you to be unaware, brethren. I often planned to come to you, but I was hindered. Um, and then he mentions again in Romans 15.22, I have been much hindered from coming to you. 
Well, this time he says, it was Satan that hindered me. How, how could Satan hinder Paul? Or rather, what means would Satan have used to hinder Paul? Yeah, non-believers is the big one, right? What about, uh, what about those Jewish persecutors, right? You know, Satan has no authority beyond that which God gives him, right? You look at the book of Job, and when Satan asks to, to tempt Job, God has to give him permission to do so, right? Satan has no authority outside of that. However, Satan's influence in the world is still strong, through sin. In Matthew chapter 25, 41, makes a reference to Satan and his angels. The word angel, whenever we encounter that in scripture, have to remember the word angel simply means messenger, right? The Greek word is angelos. And so what, we, what people did when they were translating the Bible was they just took angelos, or we're going to take kind of the Greek word and sound it out in English, and we've invented the word angel. It just means messenger, right? And so people who are serving Satan and giving his message, and ultimately Satan's message is do what you want. Do what makes you happy regardless of what God tells you, right? That's exactly how he tempted Eve in the garden, right? Is saying, hey, this fruit is, is good. This fruit is going to make you knowledgeable Maybe you should eat it. Maybe God doesn't want you to have this thing. Do what you want. Right? That's the same message. Well, all of these different messengers, servants of Satan, everybody who falls into the category of trying to bring us away from the gospel can be this messenger of Satan. So in a way, these Jewish persecutors were acting as the agents of Satan that were hindering Paul, right? Satan works primarily today through the influence of ungodly people. And I think that that is no easier to see than in the life of Paul. Right? And then he ends in verses 19 to 20, ends chapter 2 by reminding the Thessalonians of just how important they really are to him. He says, what is our hope? or joy, or crown of rejoicing, is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming for you are our glory and joy. And you look at the colors that I have highlighted. One of the favorite literary techniques of the Greeks and the Jews, Jews especially, is called chiasm, where essentially you will have two ideas and then sandwiched in the middle is the thing that you want to highlight. Right? So here we have this idea of hope, joy, and rejoicing, and then glory and joy. And right there in the middle, to really emphasize what it is that is going to make Paul happy and joyful, is you in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming. Paul wanted nothing more than to see the people that he ministered to to be in the presence of God on the judgment day. And of course he means to be in the presence of God in a positive way, to be brought into the presence of God for eternity. That's what Paul wanted to see. You know, for Paul, that was the, the absolute measure of success was whether or not the people that he ministered to were going to make it to heaven. And so Paul is telling them, I, I want to be there because my entire life's work is all about you. Right? His entire life's work was centered around other people. And I think we can take a lot of, of encouragement and inspiration from Paul's mindset here. Right? As Christians, our life cannot just be about me. Right? We should have an outward focus to see how can I help my brethren how can I help those who are lost and bring them into the fold and bring them to Jesus? How can I be of service to, to my family, both my blood family and my Christian family? It is an others-focused religion. And I think Paul is highlighting that for them here. Right? Paul's desire, nothing to do with him. 
His ultimate desire was for them to be faithful and be in heaven. Right? So emphasizing to them how much he cares to encourage them to stand fast against this persecution they were facing. Right? And so with that in mind, with his desire to see them and his being hindered, he talks in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 about what he did because he was so concerned about the faith of the Thessalonians. He said, therefore, when we can no longer endure it, we thought it would be good to be left in Athens alone and sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith, that no one should be shaken by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. For in fact, we told you before when we were with you that we would suffer tribulation just as it happened and you know. For this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you and our labor might be in vain. All right, so twice Paul uses this phrase, when I could no longer endure it. All right, Paul really worried about the brethren that he left behind in Thessalonica. Right? And remember, he spent precious little time there. According to Acts chapter 17, he was only there reasoning for three Sabbaths in the synagogue. Right? So he had three weeks where he got to be with these brethren before he was run out of town. And considering the circumstances under which he had to leave Thessalonica, you can understand why he might be concerned for these new converts in Christ. I think we see Paul's deep concern for Christians throughout his letters. And uh, I think this is a really good example in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty two to 29 Paul gives this long list of things that he had suffered for Jesus, um, included being beaten, uh, being stoned and left for dead, being shipwrecked, uh, having sleepless nights, going without food and being hungry. But in verse 28... He says, besides the other things that come upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. All right, Paul was immensely concerned about the faithfulness of his brethren. He cared about them. And so when, he, when that worry became so much, says, I, I couldn't take it anymore. We thought it'd be good to be left in Athens alone, and we sent Timothy. Now, Timothy was sent for a good reason, and Paul kind of gives his credentials here, calls him our brother, right? First and foremost, Timothy was a, a brother in Christ and a member of God's family, that he was a minister of God. The word minister here means servant, right? So he was a servant of God, dedicated to the service of the Lord, just like Paul was, and a fellow laborer of Paul, meaning that his work was of the same type and same quality as Paul's. His goals were the same as Paul's. His mission was the same as Paul's. And so these last two phrases indicate to me that Timothy wasn't just some type of, of, of junior preacher that Paul was sending just because he couldn't go. He was sending someone who was well qualified and who loved the Lord and loved the people the way that he did. In Philippians chapter 2, 19 through 23, Paul talks about Timothy as one who cares for you like no one else. If I could kind of put the DJ paraphrase to it. He says, I, I love you, I care for you, and nobody loves you the way that Timothy does. Right? He was a man who was very, very um, attentive to the needs of the church just the way that Paul was. Notice, I, I want to focus on verse 1. It says that we thought it good to be left in Athens alone. That word alone implies being without something that's necessary, right? without needed assistance. It was a sacrifice for Paul to send Timothy away. Right? We read in Acts chapter 17 that in Athens, it was a very, very pagan place. Paul would have needed the encouragement that Timothy could have given him, but Paul also recognized that the Thessalonians needed him more. And so he sent this faithful brother and minister to go and to encourage them so that they could stand fast against persecutions. 
right, that no one should be shaken by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. Timothy was sent because the Thessalonians still needed encouragement. They needed to be reminded that choosing to suffer for Christ was a blessing. You know, the, the persecution wasn't just going to go away, right? And that's something that we have to recognize as Christians is that we never are going to live in a world where there is no friction because of our choice to believe in Christ. And if we have created a world where there is no friction for our belief in Christ, we've created a fantasy. Right? We've created a situation where people perhaps aren't really convinced, and maybe we're not doing enough if there's not any friction because of our choice to be a Christian. However, the persecution wasn't going away. Right? He says we are appointed to this. It was up to the Thessalonians to handle it correctly. Right? Again, persecution is part of the Christian life. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12, it says, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And then I want to read in 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning in verse 12. If you turn there with me. 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning in verse 12. Peter also writing to a church in a similar situation. This is the encouragement and reminder that he gives them. He said, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you can also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you for the spirit and glory of God rests upon you. On their part, he's blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. Let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Let him glorify God in this matter. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and sinner appear? Therefore, let us who suffer according to the will of God... Commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. Right? Peter's point there in 1 Peter 4 and verse 12 is that, hey, persecution, because you are a Christian, it's natural. Right? Earlier on in the book, he'll talk about, um, you know, when you make a change and you decide, I'm not going to do the things I used to do, the things that God told me is sinful, I'm going to make a change. He says, when your friends realize that you're not running in the same flood of dissipation, I like the, the King James Version, calls it the superfluity of naughtiness. I love that phrase. But he says, when you're not living in the same type of wickedness, those people are going to speak evil of you. Don't be surprised. A lot of times when people see us trying to make positive changes, and they realize they're being left behind, they're not going to have a good response. But what Paul is trying to tell them is that whatever you have to suffer, what we can gain in Christ is so much better. And Paul tells them in uh, 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse 4, we told you that there was going to be tribulation coming. Right? Remember, he left because of all of the persecution that was there. And he said, we told you it was going to happen. You saw that it happened. And he's, then he says, for this reason, when we can no longer endure, I sent to know your faith. Right? Paul had to know how they were doing because he didn't want all of that labor to be in vain. He didn't want them to fall away from the gospel that they had already suffered so much for and to have that suffering be for naught. Right? Paul wanted to make sure they were going to be steadfast in their faith. And really, for Paul, nothing was going to hurt more than to think that his children in the faith might fall away. Right? And so Paul did everything that he could, everything in his power, to make sure that they had the encouragement he needed. He, he sent Timothy to them, and then behind Timothy came this letter. Or perhaps Timothy was the one that brought this letter to them. Also a possibility. 
Paul was trying to make sure that their needs were taken care of, even when he was not able to be there himself. All right, questions or comments before we close for tonight? I know we covered a lot. We're trying to get through a lot uh, with our remaining weeks together, but questions or comments before we close? All right, let's have a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day and for the opportunity that we have to be together. Lord, we thank you for Paul and the things that he wrote to the Thessalonians and that uh, we have the benefit of being able to look back on those things and to learn from them. Father, pray that we might stand fast against the persecution that we might face in our lives and that we might do so by our togetherness, that we might be involved with one another, that we might lift one another up in times uh, of, of difficulty and that we together might help each other be faithful until that final day when Jesus will come to take us home. Lord, be with us as we leave here tonight, that you would watch over us and keep us safe. And Lord, if it be your will, pray that we might be able to come together once again. Things we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, y'all are dismissed.